Did he really give away the store? Politicians and pundits were stunned to hear Donald Trump side with Vladimir Putin against his own intelligence services. Is it all theatrics from a former reality TV star, one who's got a definite flair for provocation, or an unprecedented attack on his own institutions by a sitting United States president? We'll ask about those institutions which, despite Trump, continue to probe and prosecute foreign agents to work on countering Russia in places like Syria and Ukraine. Is Donald Trump precipitating a decline of the world's biggest superpower, or is he just a one-off outlier? As for Putin, will the disruption in Washington ultimately play in his favor? He may project strength. But remember, at the end of the day, he's still the longtime leader of an often dysfunctional autocracy that depends on oil and gas, where the president's inner circle continue as well to remain under sanctions. What's the best the Kremlin can hope for out of all this? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering, is there or is there not collusion? And with us, former French ambassador to Russia, Jean de Grignasty, now research director for the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs, IRIS, Thank you for being with us. Thank you. We want to welcome back as well the author of Bear Hunting with the Politburo, Craig Kapitas, editor at large for TRT World. How are you? Okay, my captain. From New York, political consultant Sam Nunberg, former campaign advisor to uh, Donald Trump. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor. And uh, from Tallahassee, Florida, we'll be joined later by Republican media strategist Rick Wilson. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. A Russia-U.S. summit like no other, which featured, well, a photo op, a closed door meeting with just the two presidents, and then a press conference. It had moments like the one when Associated Press reporter Jonathan Lemire asked a question. President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. What, who, my first question for you, sir, is who do you believe? My second question is, would you now, with the whole world watching, tell President Putin, would you denounce what happened in 2016, and would you warn him to never do it again? So let me just say that we have two thoughts. You have groups that are wondering why the FBI never took the server. Why haven't they taken the server? Why was the FBI told to leave the office of the Democratic National Committee? I've been wondering that. I've been asking that for months and months, and I've been tweeting it out and calling it out on social media. Where is the server? I want to know where is the server and what is the server saying? With that being said, all I can do is ask the question. My People came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be, but I really do want to see the server. What conclusions do you draw from that, Jean de Grignesti? Well, <clears throat> the stake remains the same. That is the legitimacy of the president. As far as I understand, um, Trump never denied that there was some kind of Russian intervention. But for him, the main goal is to obtain some clearance regarding the legitimacy of his own election. But disowning uh, his own intelligence service? Well, I think it's a blunder in any case. Craig Kapitas? No, it's a complete blunder. I've run out of adjectives to describe this. Uh, in the history of the United States presidency, there has never been a president who has done anything even close to this, something, something so incredibly embarrassing. And, and I, can, I can say that, I, I think, with some authority. I covered every summit meeting between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, as well as the summits between President Bush uh, and Gorbachev. Uh, I, I was there. I, I knew Boris Yeltsin well. I know Mikhail Gorbachev. I, I know these people. I worked there for 10 years in the Soviet Union, Russia. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I am just speechless at, at, at what Donald Trump did yesterday. It, it was just an, it, it, it was an embarrassment, and, and I think we've just run out of adjectives. Sam Nunberg, are you embarrassed? 
not embarrassed. I fully expected this. Uh, look, I had been on TV in, in the United States saying, I hope the president uh, pulled a, I called it pulled a Macron, where your president confronted Vladimir Putin on the stage and, and said that, yes, you tried to intervene in our election and, re and you hacked, tried to release documents. With that said, it's important to note the context of this happening. First of all, the president is constitutionally incapable of doing the nuance of saying, yes, Russia meddled, however, there was no collusion. You have to remember, though, it was highly, highly inappropriate. The previous uh, person said he doesn't remember this ever happening. I don't remember it ever happening in the history of the United States that Robert Mueller, who's essentially the acting attorney general of our country, and I don't remember he, him being confirmed, I may have missed it, would release an indictment within three days of this president meeting with Vladimir Putin and trying to conduct his own foreign policy. That was outrageous. And the president is sitting there on stage being a target of this investigation where Mueller does, and he does, want the president impeached by saying that the president is part of some conspiracy. So the president was in an untenable situation. With that said, it is completely unacceptable for any president on foreign soil or domestically to question our intelligence with a foreign leader. Uh, I, listen, I cannot speak to the uh, uh, arguments going on in the United States. I do not cover the United States. Yeah, just, just a word on that. There, there are uh, there's two tracks, because on the one hand, there is the uh, special prosecutor who uh, we, we, we just heard about there from San Nunberga, Robert Mueller. And at the same time, there's the work of the Justice Department. And immediately after the Helsinki summit finished, there was the arrest of a suspected uh, Russian agent in, in Washington. But those are two different things. Uh, listen, I, I, the ambassador can correct me here he, if, if, if he disagrees. But Vladimir Putin and the Russians don't give a fig about what's going on in the United States. This was a provocation, a provocatie, designed by Moscow Center, following all uh, rules and regulations of the KGB, going back to the Okhrana, to infiltrate the United States, to affect, not to make mischief. You make, your mother-in-law makes mischief. This was an infiltration. Whether the infiltration was successful or not, as far as the United States sees it as, is one question. But I can guarantee you, sir, that Lubyanka right now, they are celebrating this was a successful provocation. Infiltrate or make mischief? In other words, just create a bit of chaos. Well, I, I don't fully agree. Um, I think uh, the main goal for Putin now is to be treated on an equal footing by America. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm not sure there is a provocation here, because the, usually the right in the Russian press and they say at the Russian political level that uh, now um, Trump is a hostage of the deep state, American deep state. And so... That's how it's reported in Moscow. Yes. And uh, so I'm not sure they are laughing uh, at, uh, um, they are rejoicing. Not sure at all for, for them. I, 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 spoke, I spoke this morning with contacts within the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, um, and within the, the Soviet uh, Justice Ministry. I can guarantee you they're laughing at the United States. They see this as a successful provocation. Whether, whether the well, West wants to believe it or not, is another issue entirely. Sam Nunberg? Well, I would be laughing as well, sir. I'll tell you why I would be laughing, because Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller is making this an untenable situation for our president. Look, any president, George W. Bush, who famously said in his first year, I, saw, I met with Vladimir Putin and I saw into his soul and he was played. And then you had Barack Obama, who went in his first year, met with Medvedev, but then met with Prime Minister Putin, who sized him up. And, you know, he had no respect for him, especially after uh, the Libya debacle. With that said, he is a hostage of unelected bureaucrats here who are trying to undo an election. Robert Mueller is acting. You know, Robert Mueller has a problem with uh, Vladimir Putin. I have a problem with Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is a thug. Vladimir Putin jails his political enemies. And Vladimir Putin manipulates his own internal election, tries to undo an election. But that is exactly what Robert Mueller is trying to do domestically here. I've been in that grand jury. I've been uh, questioned by them. I've given them my documents. They are looking for anything and everything. They are going over private matters of the president that have nothing to do with his election.
And I would also tell you to argue, as James Clapper did, to say that the Russian Facebook posts were the decisive factor in delivering this election uh, to Donald Trump is absolute hogwash. And so the president, I, if I was this president, I would not trust the most senior leadership of the intelligence community, and that's the dilemma that America is in. He but, has but, no you're, but you're also saying that you wouldn't work. But even James if you Comey. didn't trust it, you're saying you wouldn't have said so uh, in front of the Russian president. He has to show. Correct. He has to show the nuance. Uh, on, on the hashtag, I worked for Donald Trump for. On the hashtag. By, by the way, let me just finish this point. It's a important point. I worked for Donald Trump for four for four years. He doesn't do nuance well. All right. He just won. <laughs> and it's hard for people like me who have to defend him, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On the hashtag F24 debate, uh, did anyone really expect Trump to declare the Russian leader a liar on global TV? What would have been the point of traveling to Helsinki and arranging a summit between the world's two biggest nuclear powers only to scuttle the chance at a new and improved uh, relationship? Uh, uh, you heard Sam Nunberg there, uh, Ambassador, uh, saying he could have pulled a Macron and uh, do what the French president did at Versailles. And uh, Yes. Uh, Can you call Putin a liar? No, no. Because, in in uh, such a situation? It, no, you don't, you don't treat a, any president a liar. <laughs> you don't call any president a liar. I mean, it's not part of the diplomatic habits. But, um, well... There is, of course, a failure somewhere because because of this blunder, I think uh, Trump tried to to get some leeway in his relations with Russia, uh, some breathing space, mm -hmm. and uh, and we need it. I mean, everybody needs that because uh, the Russian-American relations are in a complete deadlock, and there are a lot of in important files and dangerous files to be discussed, and uh, he tried to to get this. Uh, margin of maneuver, and it didn't get it. And it will never work. It will never work. You know, we have to look at history here. Donald Trump was the most ill-prepared president who's ever gone into any meeting with a Russian leader. You know, back yeah, in... The, the, the Economist writing I that... Don't, uh, this, I don't know about that. This no, was, I, do, I do know about that, sir, and I can tell you why. Really? Yeah, yeah, I actually do. Because really, I'd look at yes, Obama's meeting in uh, 2014. I, I'm not, that was pretty pathetic. Uh, uh, don't give me the whataboutism <laughs> to, co to coin a Soviet term. Right now, we're talking about President Donald Trump. And well, I'm you, gonna, said and I'm gonna give, you said the and most I'm ever. You said the most ever. I don't I'm think going he's the most ever. You, it, Obama actually you said the most ever. Obama read his briefing books. I doubt President Trump read one briefing book. I doubt if I doubt if Obama told Obama I doubt if one of Trump's and then he was sitting there uh, like State a child. State Department next advisors to Putin. mentioned the one of the time, please. One of the time, that he would know what he's talking about. Back in 1839, there was a gentleman by a right. French gentleman by the name of de Tocqueville who wrote a book called Democracy in, Mer in America, which is regarded as, as kind of a biblical tome on the United States. At the very same time, there was another Frenchman doing the same thing in Russia. His name was the Marquis de Castine, and his book was be called, called Empire of the Tsar. It is required reading for anyone who studies Russia or the Soviet Union. In Empire of the Tsar, the Marquis de Quistine wrote the following, I do not reproach the Russians for being what they are. What I blame in them is their pretending to be what we are. America and the West is different from the Russians. It is impolite to say that. So you need to be briefed when you go in. Parties. Ab Can I, I got to make an important point here, sir. The Let me make an important point. Putin said yesterday, and it's, a hun and it's obvious, he wanted Donald Trump to win. And he did want Donald Trump to win. However... Here's the, here's the obvious point, which nobody has any response to. Don't judge Donald Trump by his words. If you judge it by his actions, let me finish before I get attacked. If you judge it by his actions, Putin is not getting a return on that investment. He's had three separate sets of sanctions passed against him, including unilaterally by the Treasury Department. He's had 60 diplomats kicked out of the country under President Trump. The President Trump has armed the Ukrainians, and President Trump bombed Syria. Plus, Putin was not happy when the president withdrew right, from wanna, the Iranian uh, in, nuclear treaty. I want to bring so, in. I want to bring so in at you this tell point me how it's worked out for Putin. Sam Nunberg, I want to bring in at this point Rick Wilson. Uh, thank you for joining us from Tallahassee, Florida. Rick, uh, the headline in French broadsheet newspaper of record, Le Monde. 
uh, for this evening is Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin's best ally with a lead editorial entitled Dangerous Liaisons. Uh, y- your thoughts on on uh, on what the impact of Helsinki will be in the long run? I don't think Delaclos could have ever imagined Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin when he wrote the novel. But I do think that we've seen a reaction around the world and certainly across the United States uh, that is that borders somewhere between shock and disappointment that an American president would behave in such a way uh, at the feet of the, the Russian strongman. And, you know, obviously Donald Trump's defenders are going to go out there and try to spin this as some sort of amazing win by the greatest negotiator ever. But it's quite obvious to everyone that Donald Trump was a cowed and frightened man in front of somebody who he treats more like a supervisor than, is, than, than, a, than a peer on the world stage. This was a disaster in every way, and every objective person knows this. And the media coverage across the country and around the world has been utterly brutal to Donald Trump on this, not because they're prejudiced against Donald Trump, but because they can use their eyes and their ears and they understand history. Well, key to this is why were there no advisors in the room? Well, I think there's a big answer there, and it's, it's quite obvious. Donald Trump doesn't want anybody in the room who's going to get subpoenaed by Robert Mueller. Donald Trump doesn't want anyone in the room to understand that his relationship with Vladimir Putin is not a standard political relationship. It is not a standard relationship between international peers. There is something here. There is something enormous. It it affects Donald Trump's behavior every day. It makes him paranoid as hell that anyone's going to penetrate that inner sanctum of what he has that is that what he Mm. feels so compromised about that Vladimir Putin has such power over him on. I mean, Putin was just was trying to hold back from dunking on him yesterday at some point. It looked uncomfortable. Like, Putin was almost thinking, like, OK, that's enough, Don. You, you, you've you laid it on thick enough. All right, we're going we're gonna to pick up on that point. When we come back, we'll take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 to be. Good. Because a new page of history gets written every day. Because breaking news can't wait. Information everywhere. In all situations. On every subject. Understanding the world. Imagining the world. France 24. A different take on the news. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're speaking on the day Donald Trump is uh, back in Washington, D.C., denounced by many senior lawmakers inside of his own party over the way he handled Vladimir Putin at that one-on-one summit in Helsinki. With us to talk about a former French ambassador to Russia, uh, Jean de Glignasty, now research director at the French uh, policy think tank Iris. Also uh, with us, the author of Bear Hunting with the Politburo, Craig Kapitis, editor-at-large uh, for TRT World. Uh, from New York, political consultant Sam Munberg, former campaign advisor to uh, Donald Trump. And from Tallahassee, Florida, Republican media strategist Rick Wilson. Welcome back to all of you. Uh, we heard in part one uh, that uh, a reporter at the press conference that followed the summit asking Donald Trump whether he believed uh, the his own intelligence community or the Russian president, uh, that same AP reporter asked Vladimir Putin whether he had compromising material on his U.S. counterpart. Do you, does the Russian government have any compromising material on President Trump or his family? (laughs) So we heard the chuckle there. There was a little that long silence, uh, Jean de Glignesti. He never really denied having uh, any compromising material. But could you learn anything from this as a diplomat, this kind of no, exchange? No, no, no. Usually during that sort of conference, you, well, you, you address international questions, but obviously the whole conference was uh, focused on the home situation in America. And it was very difficult in any case for Putin to intervene mm. or to answer that sort of question. You heard Rick Wilson's explanation of why it is that uh, when they had their their one-on-one meeting, there were no advisors in the room. What, what do you think about it? Well, first we 
we have to notice that there was a long meeting between Lavrov, the two ministers of foreign affairs, and I think the real job, some sort of real job, had been done, done uh, here at this place between the ministers. Then, of course, it was the first meeting between the two presidents. They, they met in APEC, but shortly. They met twice uh, in multilateral events. But it, the first real face-to-face -face meeting. And I guess, I, I don't know Mr. Trump, but uh, his type of uh, contact, the contact he wants to establish with uh, Putin, uh, is this sort of contact. And of course, I agree mm. with the fact that he, he, he wouldn't like to be embarrassed by uh, some free words. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Nunberg? Well, the president, first of all, Rick is 100 percent correct. The president cannot meet with anybody else in the room one-on-one. -on -one. Robert Mueller will probably even subpoena those notes that were taken by his translator. He doesn't want anything leaked out. Uh, the track record of his conversations early in his presidency being leaked out by either Obama holdovers or unelected bureaucrats, uh, as you recall, with, with whether it was Australia, Putin, whatever happened in the um, meeting with Tillerson that after the president stupidly met with, uh, with the Russians the day after he fired Comey. So he wanted to be one-on-one. -on -one. And the other reason I would say, too, and this is a point that I think has to be talked about, is, look, election meddling should be high on the agenda. But you know what also should be high on the agenda? North Korea, Syria, and Iran. And the president has to deal with those as well. So if something leaks out where it says, well, you only discussed election meddling, this or that, he, he's in a rock. Once again, he's in a rock and a hard place, which is why I go back to Mueller never should have released that indictment. If Mueller doesn't want to believe in coincidences and he wants to have some conspiracy to impeach Donald Trump, which is what he wants, then I don't believe in coincidences by him. So there it goes. And that's the reason why a lot of us have uh, problems in general with special prosecutors. Mueller is, a, is, is essentially the acting attorney general of the United States. Once again, I don't remember him going through a confirmation, but apparently he also thinks he sets foreign policy, too. So I don't think the president is being uh, well served when he has that indictment uh, released. Or right, one of those who did go through a confirmation process is the former CIA uh, director, John Brennan, uh, who served in the high echelons uh, of the agency under both Democratic and Republican presidents. He put out a vociferous tweet. Donald Trump's press conference performance in Helsinki rises to and exceeds the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors which is uh, one of the terms put in the Constitution to uh, remove a president from office. It was nothing short of treasonous. Not only were Trump, Trump's comments imbecilic, he's wholly in the pocket of Putin. Republican patriots, where are you? Uh, Craig Capitas, your, your reaction. Well, I'm going to actually have to agree with Sam on this because treasonous doesn't operate here. Treason can only be charged against someone in the United States if we're at war with the country in question. So if the United States Congress declares war on Russia, then Donald Trump could indeed be charged with treason. The other thing he could have been charged is with was sedition, but the Sedition Act was repealed in 1920, and the uh, Espionage Act does, doesn't yet apply here. So as I said, we're running out of adjectives, and when I see a former CIA director using the word treason, quite frankly, he should know better, and he doesn't. The issue here, as I see it, is what could Trump do, or do to punish the Russians? Sanctions do not work. I won't go into the reasons why. The ambassador, please, please enumerate if, if you'd like. But let me tell you the way to get to the Russians. That is to shut them out of SWIFT. That is the international mechanism that allows the transfer of money between countries. Now, some might say the moment that you do that, the Russians are going to cozy up with the Chinese. I would say no to that. And the reason is the Russian oligarchs do not want to invest in China. They don't want to live in China because it's not a, a country that's run by laws. You cut Russia off of SWIFT. That, that is the economic nuclear option, and it's, some, it's one that, that would get some sort of result, I would argue. Jean de Glignesti? Uh, on SWIFT, I think it, it's a 
rather bad idea, you know, for the Europeans. The Europeans need, need to keep some link and some contact and some trade with Russia. It's, it's basic. It's not the case of America. The, uh, the uh, share of uh, the American goods on the uh, Russian import, it's uh, five percent. And since the sanctions, it's went up to six percent. For, it's not the case for uh, Germany, uh, which lost uh, at least four points of its trade mm -hmm. with Russia to China. It's not the case for France, which just maintained its chair, and, uh, and Italy lost a lot. So we need some kind of uh, uh, trade relation with uh, Russia. We invest also a lot. The French invest a lot. We are the first investor in, in Russia. First investor, if you, of course, you have uh, Rotterdam in the, in the Netherlands, sure. because, uh, but it, it doesn't mean anything. And you have also the, the uh, islands, uh, uh, yeah, but paradise. Doesn't it, does, it not, does it not beg the question? If Russia is a belligerent player, which it clearly is, at what point do the Europeans and the EU start playing tough with them, regardless of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, regardless of all the deals? At some point, you know, Mr. Ambassador, that diplomacy with the Russians on this level does not work. It's a lot of talk and a lot of yibber-yabber. When do you take the gloves off? That's my question. Um, work to what end? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the American hacking is not our problem. Uh, uh, yeah. The American democracy is not our icon. Mm -hmm. So we have our own problems with Russia, which are not the same, and which doesn't deserve such a treatment. But you're a member of NATO. NATO, I think, uh, well, the main um, object, the main theme of the meeting was the mere survival of NATO. So it's difficult to talk about well, has, Was America attacked, the, the Russian cyber attacks on the United States? Does that meet your definition of, a, of an aggressive act against a NATO state? Yes, it's a, I mean, it's not a friendly act in any case, but it's cyber attack. Because part, part of the Atlantic Alliance is, yeah. is that uh, if one member is attacked, the others are what is it, Article 5? Yes. Article 5. Uh, uh, of the, you, all members have to be in solidarity. When the Article 5 was ri written at that time, uh, the, the word cyber attack does, uh, didn't exist. And uh, you say a cyber attack, but there is no death, no casualties. It's not exactly the same, I'm sorry. Rick Wilson, uh, what's going on uh, in the United States? What goes on between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump? Is it our business in countries that are not uh, that are not, you know, the United States or Russia? Well, there is a Western alliance and a, there is a NATO alliance, and there is a commonality and a similarity of values between Western free market nations and, 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 and democratic nations that has long bound together the U.S. and, and our European allies. And attacks on the, our European allies, such as the, the chemical weapons attack in Britain recently, um, you know, we, we should treat these special warfare types of attacks with the seriousness that they require. And look, in this modern era, you know, a cyber attack could shut off a power grid and that could cost the lives of thousands of people. Mm. There are many, you know, things on the spectrum and the responses have to be calibrated. But I think Article 5 should be viewed as something that we all take, uh, you know, as part of a spectrum of responses to potential actions by bad, by bad players. And, and Article 5 has, has long held up, uh, you know, as, as this one binding question. And the, the last time it was invoked was in uh, on the, uh, September 12th of 2001. And that was when Europe came to our defense and Europe came to help the U U.S. after the 9-11 attacks by Al Qaeda. So I think we should be very respectful of Article 5. We should treat these attacks, even if they're on the special warfare spectrum, with great seriousness. And I think that Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in Europe right now who question whether Donald Trump has that same commitment. Um, although, you know, Secretary Mattis, Secretary Pompeo, uh, Ambassador um, Kay Bailey Hutchison, they've all come out and basically said, we treat this with all the seriousness it still requires. They're just, you know, those leaders are just very worried about whether Donald Trump 
has the the the, the so, same so why does to the, so to okay that, so rick, uh, rick in that case why does trump do it why does he go into a nato summit and pick a fight with germany's chancellor is he doing it if all of his uh, uh cabinet if all of his top brass are telling him to do the opposite. Is he doing it to be contrary because it's all good political theater and it drives the ratings? Why? <laughs> Part of it is that Donald Trump acts purely from impulse. He is not a person with a lot of considered political philosophy. He just goes by his gut. He comes from this world of both New York City's tabloids and of reality TV. And so he loves these fights that make him seem like he's the alpha male in the room and the big <laughs> dog in the room. And, and sometimes he wins those fights, but he always does them without the country in mind. He doesn't do it with the United States in mind. It's always about Donald Trump's brand image and Donald Trump's personal political position and, and how Donald Trump looks on TV that night. He doesn't think about what, the, what the, the broader good for the American people might be or the broader good for the Western alliance. There was no reason to go into that NATO summit and, and, and smack talk our allies. Because the thing he claims he was achieving of billions of dollars being given to him, well, it's, it's an utter lie. It was going to be called out as a lie. And the next day, you know, he rolls over for Vladimir Putin. So these people are looking at this guy as a showman, not as a statesman. And I think that it's, I, I think that it's, it very much speaks to Donald Trump's character and the compromise that is, that is obvious in everything he does when it comes to Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. He will insult our closest allies. He will insult people whose troops who have fought and died next to us in, in the war on terror, but he treats Vladimir Putin with kid gloves. It's a message everybody gets very clearly. They understand it, and they understand it's a combination of a shallow, weak character and, and someone who's f profoundly compromised. Sam Nunberg, uh, if it's about driving ratings, Donald Trump's a great president because uh, uh, the ratings are through the roof on the, on the news channels in the United States. Uh, but uh, here, something like a NATO summit, we're talking about security and world peace. Well, once again, judge him by his actions, not his words. First of all, when he's criticizing that Nord Stream 2 deal, that's not good for Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin needs that deal for his economy. The Russian economy, I think, is even smaller than the state of New York, which I'm speaking to you from. And essentially, all they have is energy. Uh, if they don't get that deal, well, they're going to control over uh, around 18 percent in total of Germany's energy supply, then they're in major trouble. Now, remember, Ukraine and Poland do not want that deal either. They've expressed their concerns. When it comes to Angela Merkel, he has a personal animus against her. And you know what? I don't blame him. I'll tell you why. She, her government, came out against his election during the campaign. I have the quotes. They said that he would be a bad president. He would be bad for the EU. He'd be bad for NATO. Yeah, well, but is a NATO all, summit the place to pick country. a fight like that? <laughs> It is, and I'll tell you why it is, because if we don't get these out of public, look, one of the reasons Donald Trump was elected, and I once again spent many hours with him, was because Americans were fed up with, uh, fe uh, with, with feckless leadership, with diplomacy the way it was done as usual, and especially after the Obama years. And to just uh, to to just you know give a give verbiage for saying well like Obama did well you need to increase your spending I think as Ambassador Bolton said he's been told by our allies that they just felt that Obama kicked it down the road the same way he kicked it down the road with the Iranian nuclear deal <coughs> so from that point of view Americans like uh, you know Americans we this is what we elected we wanted something different that is why he beat 16 people trust me I tried to get him defeated I went and endorsed. Ted Cruz after I was uh, unceremoniously and unfairly fired and he was a juggernaut and he outworked her towards the election and that's one of the reasons he won so um, you once again go by facts and go by what America's commitment to NATO <clears throat> militarily uh, Craig Capitas which by the way has increased under President Trump and our military defense spending has increased there's there's a much larger question here that we're all dancing around it's Western democracies uh, Western trade alliances orbit around the concept of a moral clarity, what the Russians call moralnaya yaznost. It's, it's an interesting word because there is no word in Russia for mor moral. It, actually, they steal it from the English. Uh, there is no moral clarity in Russia. Historically, there never has been. 
and there won't be for quite some time. This is not something. Really, you can't mean this is not something that's polite that you discuss at polite diplomatic cocktail parties. But I can tell you, I had numerous discussions on this with uh, diplomats at the French embassy, the British embassy, and at Spasso House in Moscow during my years there, and at the Harriman Institute. This is discussed. So here's my question. Actually, I, I think it's a question for the ambassador and our uh, and your other guests here tonight. The Western democracies and trade alliances can obviously survive four years of Donald Trump. The question is, can they survive eight years of this lunacy? That is the big unanswered question. And what Vladimir Putin is playing for here is a Trump re-election to further destabilize the Western trade alliances, the Western military alliances. He's playing a very long game here. This is how the KGB operates. So my question is, actually for the group, and excuse me for asking this of everyone, but can these alliances, Mr. Ambassador, can they survive eight years of Donald Trump? Well, depends. It depends. Because, uh, you know, uh, I'm struck by the fact that all these questions are dealt with by the American observers, uh, the media, and so on, from strictly the home point of view of yes. the domestic prism. Yes. And, uh, Parochialism. Yes. And, um, and for, to this use, I mean, the danger of Russia and the question of Russia is uh, inflated. You know, Russia is one-tenth of the military budget of America. It's the equivalent of the GNP of Spain. It's a country with demography weakness, with demographic weakness. And uh, it's, sometimes it's ununderstandable how Russia becomes a, such a big danger for such a big country as America. And we are not in this state of mind in Europe, as you know. We know the, 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 f the, the weaknesses and the, the strength also of Russia. So it all has to be put in perspective. We're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we've run out of time. So much more to talk about. Jean de Glignasty, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Craig Capitis, uh, Rick Wilson in Tallahassee, Sam Nunberg in New York. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to Emma James. Hi there. Uh, Donald Trump, he does drive the ratings. He does drive the ratings. He also drives a lot of discussions online. Mm. Uh, and he gets a lot of front pages, too. Uh, lots of very strong words being used about this particular press conference. Disgraceful, shameful, treasonous. But I think probably the strongest words and image comes from uh, the New York Daily News, which really has uh, gone Quite a long way, I think, with this uh, front page. Open treason, it says. Donald Trump holding the hand of Vladimir Putin while he uh, opens fire on good old Uncle Sam. And you'll notice the Fifth Avenue road sign. This is a nod to the fact that when he was campaigning to be president, Donald Trump said, I could go out onto Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and people would still go and vote for me. And that's a real nod to that particular comment from uh, the president. Now, Far more interestingly, perhaps, is the fact that the normally more conservative New York Post has gone also with a very strong front page, see no evil. Um, and they've referred to Vladimir Putin as uh, Trump's wicked BFF, uh, best friend forever. Um, so it's interesting to see that it's not just sticking along those party lines uh, when it comes to the press coverage of this. Um, other places that we're seeing a uh, rather unusual stance, perhaps, you might think that Finland was the neutral host, but their front page uh, today says Trump nil, Putin won. They clearly think uh, that Putin got the best of uh, the US president on this occasion. Uh, and the UK's Daily Mirror goes with Putin's poodle. Now, they may be smarting mm. a little bit, having not got that exclusive interview when he was in the UK. That went to their big tabloid rivals, The Sun, of course. Um, but poodle is something that gets bandied around a lot in the United Kingdom. Tony Blair yes, was we'll always called... That. Exactly. Tony Blair was always George <laughs> W. Bush's poodle. Um, so to go with this, Putin's Poodle. Uh, they are trying to really attack uh, the vanity of Donald Trump, I think it's fair to say. Uh, the cartoonist doing much the same. This from the New, uh, New uh, Zealand Herald, Rob Emerson. <laughs> 
has uh, France winning the World Cup in Moscow, uh, Novak Djokovic <laughs> taking the Wimbledon title, and you've got Vladimir Putin there holding Donald Trump aloft like a little trophy. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful cartoon there from Rob Ellison. Uh, this from Matt Verka in uh, Politico. Uh, what looks perfectly normal summit to me, says uh, the GOP <laughs> elephant wearing oh, his dear. Make America Great Again hat. And, of course, oh, Donald Trump there as a dancing bear. It's all about bear. stereotypes, those cartoons. <laughs> Very much so. Now, Donald Trump has been tweeting about this, saying that um, basically it's not being reported fairly. The fake news is going crazy, according yeah, to I, him. Yeah, I even had a better meeting with Vladimir Putin, he says. Absolutely. <laughs> he thinks everything's gone absolutely fine. He's not listening to the critics at all. Uh, what's interesting, though, is when you look at this, this uh, journalist has put together some of the uh, headlines and front pages uh, of newspapers from, as he calls it, some of the Trumpiest states. Trumpiest so states. Those most in his corner. Um, and it is interesting to see that they are taking a very straight line on this, but there are little hints of criticism in there too. Um, so they're not going all out and joining in the full-blooded uh, criticism that we're seeing in a lot of other places. Uh, they're sort of walking a fairly careful straight line at the moment. Mm. Um, but what will probably have more impact is the fact that people like uh, Brian Kilmeade from Fox and Friends, we all know that uh, Donald Trump is a huge fan of that programme. Even he is saying that Donald Trump has got it wrong uh, with what he said uh, while standing next to Putin, while siding with Russia and, and obviously not giving his backing to the US uh, intelligence services. Even more surprising, perhaps, is this editorial from uh, the Wall Street Journal. It's from the editorial board. It is unusually scathing when it comes to uh, talking about Donald Trump. And what they say is that um, this is a personal and national embarrassment. They say for a rare moment in his presidency, Mr. Trump also projected weakness. Now, they feel that this is going to play into all the wrong hands in terms of Trump's future performance. Craig Kapitas, our Washington correspondent, was saying so much has blown over. This will probably blow over as well. I don't believe so. I, I think it is going to continue to roll because Trump has fundamentally defenestrated uh, the, the, the post-World War II order uh, by, by playing this uh, way with, with, with Putin. This is why I, I, I don't think we're the only people to say that we've run out of adjectives to describe this. No, we have never seen this before. All right, we'll leave it there. But many thanks uh, to our panel. I want to thank you as well, Emma James. Thank you for joining us here. More coverage to come on France 24. Thanks for being with us in the France 24 debate. I'm Jessica Numazurier. I am Paul Bankat's New York and United Nations correspondent. You can find my live coverage and reports on France 24's news programs and on France24.com. Jessica Numazurier, one of the 160 France 24 correspondents around the world.